and welcome along to Nine Plus, a podcast about research being conducted at SETU. That's the Southeast Technological University of Ireland. I'm your host, Rob O'Connor from SETU. In this episode, I'm speaking with three academics about their research into early 20th century Irish playwright and author, Theresa Devi. Uh, we also talk about a collaboration they're involved in with the Dublin Theatre of the Deaf based around Devi's works. The panel is made up of Dr. Una Keeley, Dr. Kate McCarthy, and Dr. Jenny O'Connor. We're also attempting something new for us, making this podcast accessible for a deaf or hard of hearing audience. There's a text transcription available and also a captioned multi-camera video of the studio recording of the podcast, as well as a version that comes with an Irish sign language overlay. I haven't come across much research into making podcasts accessible for a hard of hearing audience, so we're mostly drawing on anecdotal material. I'd certainly be interested in receiving feedback anyone has about the accessibility of the podcast, good or bad. My direct email is robert.oconnor at setu.ie. So let's get into it and learn a bit about Teresa Devi. Welcome to Nine Plus, a research podcast from SETU. My name is Rob O'Connor. Today I'm speaking with three academics from the School of Humanities about their research into author and playwright Theresa Devi. We have Una Keeley. Hi, Rob. We have Kate McCarthy. Hello. And we have Jenny O'Connor. Hi. We'll start with a question for yourself, Una. It's a fairly basic question. Who is Theresa Devi? Teresa Devi was born in 1894. She died in 1963. She was a playwright. She went to school in Waterford. She was a boarder in the Ursuline Convent. She contracted Meniere's disease in her early adulthood, um, which left her deaf. She went to London to study lip reading. She stayed with her sister in London. She came. She went to the theatre a lot when she was living in London decided when she was there, I could write a play. I could I could write a play that critiques Ireland in the same way that the plays I'm looking at are critiquing um, British life and times and culture. And she did that. She submitted her plays to the Abbey Theatre. In starting that those submissions in the late 1920s, had a really, um, really wonderful career in the Abbey in the 1930s. Six plays produced in the Abbey in the 1930s, was highly rated, included in festivals. Um, her work was toured to America. Um, she, she really made a name for herself. And in the 1940s, the Abbey Theatre changed hands. Different things were happening. The Irish Constitution was published in 1937. Times were changing. They didn't f- augur well for DV and her work um, really became much less popular, less popular because it wasn't staged. And she then spent a period of time trying to find a new um, home for her plays. She found a a home for some of her plays in the Studio Theatre Club run by Madame Daisy Bannard Cogley. Her work was also produced, um, Devi's work was also produced in the experimental um, Peacock Theatre in the Abbey in the 1940s and she wrote short stories and mentored other playwrights, was very involved in the cultural scene in Dublin but really she died in 1963 and really the period from 1940, 1960, 1970 really fell into obscurity and then there was a revival of her work really in the I suppose the 80s um, and the 90s, um, particularly the 90s. And then a resurgence of interest in her work um, in more recent times. But I suppose who she was, the answer is she's she's a woman from Waterford who wrote plays uh, and her plays were interested in women's experiences and women's lives and women's lives and how they and how women experience life in Irish society, and I suppose particularly in the nineteen twenties, thirties, forties. But that story is still interesting and relevant today. Would she be an unusual voice for that time? 
she wouldn't have been that unusual in what she was saying. There were many women who were arguing for women's rights and many women who were feminists. And we know the stories of some of those women. Um, we're thinking of um, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, um, the suffrage movement in Ireland, um, Come in a Man. There was lots of women's organisations who were absolutely dedicated to promoting women's rights and equality for women. And Theresa Devey was one of that, um, I suppose, group of women who became active in as a feminist by translating that intention to further equality into playwriting. So she wouldn't be unusual in that her voice chimed with many voices that were making the same arguments at the time. What made her unusual was that she was a very successful playwright in the Abbey Theatre at the time. There were other women who writing plays at this time, there were other successful women writing plays, at, but none were as successful as D.V. And so I suppose that success with the Abbey um, and the the quality of the work that she produced, that's what makes her exceptional and different. Kate, can you tell me how you became interested in Theresa Devi's work? Well, it was about, I think, 2015 and Una and her PhD student, Dana Killen, had been doing some early research around Devi and we were looking for a text to work on with our theatre study students. So we decided we would work with the King of Spain's daughter, um, a, a DV1 act. And it was really through that practice-based exploration and understanding of the text. That's really how I came to understand and appreciate what was what I think uh, is really at the centre of her work is this commitment to challenging the status quo, the, the to challenge the dominant conversation around the role of women in society. Um, and her plays are like, I suppose they're like interventions into this more national conversation around, which is still ongoing, what women's bodies, women's freedoms, uh, around choices. Um, and so so it was really through my work with the students um, f- and we produced that play, a play reading of that text for Culture Night and we staged it uh, at the Waterford Medieval Museum. Uh, and that's really important to us that, that I suppose we are part of uh, the resurgence, if you like, of, of trying to promote her work with our students and within the region. Um, what's driving our interest in DV at the moment are two projects. So we have, first, just I suppose to go back to what Kate said, exploring DV's work through the practice, even if that's through a rehearsed reading methodology, rehearsing, re- reading, rehearsing that reading and not performing, but sharing the work through that reading and having t- discussions afterwards. That has really helped us understand, as Kate said, the way the plays work. So understanding the way they work from the inside out through the practice. And that is where we started with DV, I suppose, in 2015 and where we're And we've developed that idea of working from the inside out with the plays, that practice based approach. And that's informing a project that we're currently working on at the moment, which is called Lyrical Bodies. So um, we're working. Lyrical Bodies is a a project built around another project. The the project that we are working around is called the Possession Project, which is a performance art project. Um, designed by Amanda Coogan, collaborating with artists and theatre makers Leanne Quigley and Alvin Jones. And they are working on exploring through practice a fragment of a ballet created by Teresa Devi that's never been performed, that's only three pages long, that isn't a ballet. It's more, than a, more like a script for a ballet, the outline of a ballet. 
And Amanda, Alvin and Leanne are working to interpret that script with Dublin Theatre of the Deaf. And I got wind of this and said, well, we'd like to devise a project to support that and to learn from that and to input into that. And so our project is called Lyrical Bodies and it is a project that works with students and staff within SETU to work with, through workshop practice, work with Amanda Leanne and Alvin to figure out what this script fragment is all about. And we are learning so much with the benefit of, of the practices research methodology. We're learning so much from our collaborators. We have the added advantage of working with a team of people who have a very particular lived experience. So uh, Alvin and Leanne are deaf and um, Amanda is a coda. She's a child of deaf adults. She's hearing, but she's a child of deaf adults. And we're working with um, Irish Sign Language tri- tr- Irish Sign Language translators, in particular, um, Quiva Coburn Gray, who's also a theatre maker, has been extraordinarily helpful to to make that project work. So, what's driving our research at the moment is this practice um, based research approach to work through work from the inside of these texts to create a new piece of work to to breathe a 21st century interpretation into this script that DV wrote possibly in the 30s possibly in the 40s possibly in the 20s we don't know because it's not dated so that's a lovely thing that we don't know and it's it's the way we're approaching that is we're allowing it to free us rather than inhibit us. Kate, you're nodding there. Yeah, that, that's a lovely way of putting it. Um, I suppose part of that story that Una's telling is around our interest, or this idea of the exclusionary narrative, you know, trying to understand why was DV excluded? Um, and so one of the other projects that we're working on that helps us to think about that, um, in 2016, Una uh, had a, an exhibition entitled Teresa D.V. The Quiet Subversive. And as part of that exhibition, uh, someone from the audience just happened to be coming to the lectures on campus and mentioned that uh, Diva used to mentor um, her uncle, who was another Waterford playwright uh, by the name of James Chasty. And um, the Power family had a collection of letters that DV wrote to Chasty. And these letters are incredible. They are letters by DV explaining how to Chasty, how to write a play, how to connect with networks in Dublin, um, how to protect yourself as an artist. Uh, So it's really her principles of playwriting. So this is the the other work that is really driving our overall project, which which is about trying to understand, uh, you know, exclusionary narratives in Ireland. And because we're learning that some of I suppose, the dominant narrative around DV about what happened to her, uh, that we are actually learning information from from her own voice that completely offer, offers a counterpoint, I suppose, to what we previously knew um, about that she didn't fall into... Uh, uh, she, you know, she wasn't invisible. She was actually very active um, up in, up to and including the 1960s in this kind of cultural space. Um, so yeah, that's they're the two the two projects that are uh, keeping us up late at night. Okay, so let's just back up a moment to talking about DV being excluded. And you mentioned that she kind of started to fall out of favour from the kind of the late 30s, 40s. Was it, was that correct? Um, the early 40s. The early 40s. What is the received wisdom and how is that being challenged now based on your own work? Well, I suppose it, the received wisdom is that, you know, she's writing plays. She's been, the, the Abbey are giving her a platform. The plays she's writing are contradicting 
the national conversation, which is around women's place is within the home. She is challenging this. She is sort of demanding that we look at other avenues for women and um, offering women other opportunities in terms of how they make meaning in their lives. So I suppose that's one of the the strands is that that work was too challenging in a country where the church and the state were hand in hand. So that's certainly been one strand that we are... Uh, that I mean, it's certainly there. We're not saying that that's uh, not the case. And that when the new artistic director, or, well, the new kind of regime took over, that her work was pushed to one side um, in, in favour of... Other plays that prioritised the kind of values that the 1937 Constitution articulated in terms of Irish identity. And I suppose another part of that narrative, particularly around Theresa Devi, is that she, one of the amazing things about Devi is that when she could no longer find a producing house in the Abbey Theatre for her work. She turned to writing and adapting, writing new plays and adapting existing plays for radio. So here you have a deaf woman writing for radio. Um, that's an exceptional, that's, that shows ac- exceptional ambition. That shows a, an artist who refuses to accept that they, that one, one uh, avenue of open, opportunity is now closed. DV shows us through her tenacious um, commitment to writing that she was never just interested in one avenue. The Abbey was not the be all and end all for her. So the narrative, the existing narrative would have been that she valiantly attempted to write for radio and did write for radio, but that her career as a playwright for the stage was kind of over. What, as Kate spoke about, the, the letters she wrote to Chasty, these reveal an, an ap- these absolutely reveal a new uh, perspective on that narrative. They reveal a woman who was absolutely committed to seeking out productions of her work on the stage, both in Dublin, in London and in New York. We have, you know, if you thought she was tenacious writing plays for radio, you know, she's even more tenacious than you thought because she's still writing and seeking out productions of her work. She's going to um, Madame Bannard Cogley's theatre. She's speaking to um, Daisy Cogley, uh, Toto Cogley and, um, you know, sending her work and having her work produced. And we've actually, th- th- that collection of letters reveals that there were more productions of Devi's work than we actually realised. And that, in the life of a playwright, uh, is a really important is a really important event. So we now can understand why um, we're beginning to join the dots between what happened in the 30s in the Abbey, what happened in the Peacock in the 40s and what happened in the little theatres in Dublin in the 50s. So where as before the narrative stopped, poor Teresa um, stopped writing plays in the 40s for the theatre. Now we say actually Let's think again, because this correspondence shows a whole nother chapter of her life and work. And that's really interesting. And we get this because of this um, correspondence exchange. And one of the things that we're doing as part of that work is reframing how theatre historians and scholars look at the correspondence of women and look at women's literary archives and recon reconsider the status of the documents within those archives. So Una, you mentioned that Theresa Devi went or became deaf at a, an early age. And you, you've mentioned about her writing radio plays and other playwrights uh, or other uh, plays. But what effect did her deafness have on her work? Or Kate, you might prefer to take that or, or Jenny, whoever wants to take it. Do you mean do we see aspects of her deaf experience within her plays? It, it could be that, yeah. I, 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 the, the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, so I know that, that it's a strange question, but when, when it's referenced that you're working with the Dublin Theatre of the Deaf, you're referencing that uh, there's a deaf woman writing 
radio plays, which are supposed to be audio media. Uh, you mentioned that she wrote a ballet, which is inherently based around music, or maybe it's not. I don't know. So is there an effect? Does her does her deafness impact on her work in any notable way? Yes. I mean, how, how does where do we see that? I think is in we know she is a master of dialogue. But in order to hear that dialogue, you you have to have silence, and there are her plays. There are so many stage directions uh, that just have that one word silence, and it's within that, you know, that so much can be communicated. So she uses the word silence uh, throughout her work. Her stage directions, but also um, much of the dialogue, it's very visual, you know. So when a character, let's say, I'm thinking of Nan Bowers, uh, you know, when she enters um, the play in Wife to James Whelan, we get quite a detailed description of the character. Um, and it, it's, it, it, of course, is giving you, let's say, clues for costume, but it's more than that. It's the, uh, symbolic. The costume becomes very symbolic very quickly. And um, so we have a very visual as a presentation of the plays already written in before, you know, the, the before they're brought to realisation on the stage. Um, Una, do you want to add? Yeah, and I suppose one, one thing that it's important for us to say is that we neither, we are not deaf. And so we cannot know what the lived experience of a deaf person is. Mm-hmm. And so we can't claim to know that and we don't claim to know that. This is why our working relationship, our partnership with Dublin Theatre of the Deaf is so important because Alvin and Leanne in particular um, have a really extraordinarily wonderful way of working and teaching us. And Amanda, whose discipline is performance art, um, the, and Amanda has said in interviews, the first thing I do is I rip up the script. <laughs> She's not interested in the words that come out of the mouth. Um, Alvin, Leanne and Amanda, it, from working with them, what I, what I understand as their practice is that they are particularly alive and sensitive and expert in expression through the body. So the physicality um, the f- how to make silence a dynamic space, how to make um, the body express all of the interpersonal dialogue and communication that happens in these moments of silences, which are so resonant and powerful. And yes, as, as performers, hearing or deaf, that's what performance does. But I think we're so lucky, so incredibly fortunate to be working with that group of practitioners in particular when we when we think about Davy's work. And can I just add something as as somebody who hasn't been with these kinds of uh, projects from the beginning? Something that you said, Una, there about Alvian and the way that she uses the body um, a little anecdote, I suppose, from from one of our workshops that happened recently was that, un- unlikely as it may seem, a Spice Girls song <laughs> was introduced by Amanda to the group and it was the song Wannabe. And she was showing, you know, the different signs for the lyrics of that song. And Alvian jumped in and said, one, you know, she said, one thing I hate, and this is all translated to the rest of us by Quiva, one thing I really hate is when people sign all of the exact words of the song. She said, and it was really funny, you know, and especially when the song is, I tell you what I want, what I really, really want. Oh, tell me what you want, you know. And so she said, really, you have to act this out. Show us through your physicality what this song is. Mm-hmm. And for me, this is such a massive learning experience. I am there um to kind of observe and document. That's my role. But um, I learned so much even from that brief moment about what um, the deaf experience of, you know, what we consider to be language is. Um, it's not what we might think it is. And it was very liberating also for everybody involved there. 
Yeah, that's a great point, Jenny, because I suppose part of what this project is about is allowing us all to challenge our biases. You know, so one of the 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 the, the I suppose the binaries that exist in this is that Teresa T- DB was deaf and we are not. Um, you know, so we are trying to challenge that by understanding actually that silence is not a lack of something, you know. And, I, and we had a brilliant uh, lecture from uh, Alvin and Leanne a- about that, that being deaf is not a loss of something. There is actually um, a huge gain there. So the silence, I suppose, that the silence that we're thinking about when we see it as a stage direction or when we're playing with it in the workshop or in the performance, it is it is exactly that. It is a very resonant space. It is It is where the body can make the most meaning, actually, for the audience um but that's yeah that's that's really important jenny so this is where the phrase or the term lyrical bodies is really coming from so it's really a bit i hate to be reductive but it's really about communication through physicality is that fair like i mean amanda is a is a visual artist first and foremost and the the body is her um her canvas if you like as as una explained um Yes, it is. It is the primary tool, I suppose, that we're all through which we're all making meaning. But it it only really works when we consider the space, when we consider time. So the work that we're working on, it's a durational performance of three hours. And also when we consider the audience, you know, the, the, the other half of the equation that has to you know, hear, <laughs> for want of a better word, and, and appreciate what it is that you're doing. Um, and DV, though she, you know, was a master, masterful at dialogue, there is so much of the physicality and the body in her work. Um, and that is why her work lends itself to the ballet and to a very contemporary practice, which is live art or, or performance art, you know, where you, you don't have to work in a very traditional way with her text. In fact, it's much better to break it open. Um, and, and she wasn't working in a very traditional way either. You know, she was trying to explore with different art forms. Absolutely. I'm just nodding away. <laughs> Sorry, <that's... laughs> Podcasts don't capture the nodding. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that happens. Um, uh, right. Let's talk about maybe some of the research outputs of the Lyrical Bodies project. So maybe Jenny, you've mentioned there that you're you're there to document, and you you use a medium which is called a digital story. Could you explain what that is and how it fits into the context of this project? Yeah. So I mean, it's really important for this project to to think about accessibility in in relation to the to the research outputs. Um, and as I said, you know. That's something that I'm learning about as well as as I go on and I join these great people um, in their projects. So um, we're thinking about how important it is as academics that you go to conferences, that you publish papers in academic journals. And that is the traditional language of, um, you know, the way that that we create these outputs. But. What we want to do here is something a little bit different. So Una and Kate would be very used to kind of distilling their research into, you know, radio interviews or press releases. And again, those kind of more accessible ways for the general public to understand what it is that they're doing. Um, But what we want to do is to to create the story of this project as well um, in a different format. So so digital stories are a really good way of doing this. Um, So... What that means is I have done a little bit of training with um, a group in a, that's based in America, Story Centre. They're based in Berkeley in California. And they have worked for many years, um, especially since the, the kind of 80s and 90s, on pioneering this model, um, which they call the digital story. Now, you can look up research on digital stories and, you know, lots of things are called digital stories. But their version of it is where you will get a group of participants into a room you will get those participants to tell a story. And so they write this story down. And this might be in response to a prompt that is created, like tell me about a fork in the road, that kind of thing. Or it might be just come along with an idea of a story, you know, a moment in your life that you want to tell. It's usually a personal story. And so the participants will record the the voiceover narration of that story. And then using a very simple editing platform, they will 
put in other elements. So photographs, maybe video clips and usually again, personal in nature, it might be family photographs, let's say. Um, they'll add maybe sound effects and music to that. And it has become uh, something bigger than than what it seems here because it's become a great tool of reflection. It's become almost kind of like a. it doesn't claim to be a therapeutic um, kind of process, but for many people, that's what they describe it to be. I know the first time I uh, wrote my story and we had to share it in a story circle, I bawled out. I bawled my eyes out and I, I didn't even know that was going to happen at all. I had no warning. And uh, the facilitator said, oh, yeah, that's that's you know pretty par for the course. Um, so I was like, what's happening to me? But it's become this tool for reflection, for advocacy, um, you know, for, for social justice issues. It's, it's fantastic. Um, but also, especially in ethnographic research, where um, researchers go into the field and they do this participatory research and they encourage uh, people to kind of make their own stories about their own lived experiences. It has branched out since then, though. And so there are other ways of making digital stories, too. And last summer I made um, a story map, it was called this story mapping project. And I told the story of our neighbour's grandmother, who was a Waterford or who is a uh, from Waterford and she's an author and she's just had a really interesting life and she has she has really great stories to tell. I interviewed her and then I created a series of stories using something called ArcGIS story mapping software, which is, again, a kind of free um, online uh, program that you can use. And so when you go on to this site, you can see a variety of stories and some of them are about, you know, specific moments in this woman's life. Others are about the the novels that she wrote. Others are about a, a geographical location. And so you, you the mapping part of it involves kind of rooting it in this geographical area. And so you can follow these little pinpoints on, the, on a map that tell you little stories. And so I felt, you know, this is really interesting. And I had this really interesting conversation where I said to Una, I don't know what I want to do with this, but I want to do something. And surely this is a great way to tell the story of maybe some Waterford, um, Waterford based kind of playwrights or, you know, women authors, all the stuff that, that kind of they're doing already. Um, and she said, OK, you need to pair this back. This is way too big. And how about coming on board with us and maybe doing something around this project? And so it's been fascinating. I've been there just kind of in the background at the workshops where students and staff have come together kind of directed by Amanda and Alvian and Leanne into these tasks where they're exploring this ballet by Teresa Devi. So this is where, as Una was saying, you're taking the text and ripping it apart. Yeah. And so I get to take lots of photographs and video clips and hopefully at the end, not only will we have lots of interesting conference papers and publications, but we'll also have this, you know, proper living kind of document of what happened. That's the idea, at least. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, this is a creative, artistic output from a research project. So the research project is creative in nature. It will yield the typical research dissemination outputs like seminars, which we've already done, um, conference papers, we've already delivered conference papers and we're working on the first publication associated with the project. And and they're great and they will be they will teach us as we as we write them. They will help us understand more about the project and reflect on the project. But the the digital story mapping aspect of this project makes it particularly unique and accessible, um, engaging, reflective. It has, you know, Jenny is, she does so much more than stand and take videos and photographs. The skill and expertise that she brings into the room, the sensitivity that she, um, that she, that she brings to knowing where to put the camera, where, to, what photographs to take, how to be there, but not in any way be in front of any of the work. 
it is exceptional and we are exceptionally lucky to have her on the team. So it sounds like there's a huge amount of blurring of boundaries between academia, performance and activism with this project. Would you have any kind of thoughts about that to to try and summarise maybe what we're doing? I mean, I think that aligns very much with Amanda Coogan's work, but also what DV was trying to do. If she was hugely socio-political aware, um, she came from a family that challenged the status quo. She builds that into her plays, um, and particularly in the 1930s, as a deafened artist, she you know, holds on to that platform for almost a decade, a literal platform on the stage, to for her productions to be seen where she is critiquing um, Irish society and life and the, the dominant messages. So I think we're just following on from that. I mean, for me, drama and theatre is art forms. Social change is at their core. They are art forms, of course, in their own right, but they are also vehicles that you can... Uh, I suppose, lean on to encourage conversations, to ask people to look again, to ask uh, questions, to, to to prompt a conversation after a production. Uh, so I think and I hope that, that this project is following, um, I suppose, within a long trajectory of, of feminist thought and practice. Absolutely. And I, lo- I loved the the phrase that Kate used there, lean on, so taking the body into into the language. And I, I would say lean on and lean into and add momentum to. So we're leaning into DV's work, which is which has a momentum of its own and we're helping that momentum to go forward. I, I love that. OK, final question, which is to do with uh, something that's happening to the side of the project, uh, Mind the Gap Films are making a documentary about Amanda Coogan and Amanda Coogan's work. And ye have become wrapped up in this now as well. Could you just tell us a little bit about that and I suppose where it fits in the context of the discussion around lyrical bodies? Una and Kate as media stars. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hanging on to the coattails of our own ambition. Um Yes, we, we were very, very fortunate again to be working with Amanda, Leanne and Alvin because they are the stars of the show. And um, the, the, as far as I understand, the documentary is about Amanda's way of cracking open, getting inside the text to work, as I said, from the inside out. And we... Are, we were so fortunate here in SETU to be funded by the um, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Office from their fund and by Research Connections in the, in the uh, second instance. And those workshops and that funding allowed us to, 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 to keep these workshops going with Amanda and, and actually be kind of useful to Amanda to and Leanne and Alvin, allowing them, the bodies, to, to begin to activate the resonances in DV's text. And, you know, part of the... Leanne Quigley was talking about this recently, is that this idea of ableism, you know, it's, it's quite a hot topic now. And I think part of the documentary's role is to, you know, make these processes more accessible to a wider audience. So this is going to be on RTE, September, October, we're not sure. You know, and that's really important for the university as well, that that our research is is communicated in across different channels in different ways. Excellent. Uh, well, to Una, Jenny and Kate, thank you very, very much for speaking with me today on this uh, episode of Nine Plus. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the, the research that's carried out here at SETU, you can uh, go to setu.ie, the website. Uh, you'll find the various staff profiles up there and links to all our works. Uh, there's also some social media links as well. So if you want to see what uh, Una is posting on Instagram, uh, off you go. Uh, we are also on Twitter at 9 plus podcast. So there's plenty of avenues to get in touch if you feel so inclined. OK, thank you very, very much. Thanks for talking to us and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks. 
hope you enjoyed this episode of nine plus as i said during the intro there are accessible videos and a text transcription to go along with the regular audio podcast feedback is most welcome even to tell us we got it all wrong you can mail me directly at robert.o'connor at setu.ie and we'll be back with a new episode soon <laughs>